Hi, everybody. Leif Jackson here, uh, VP of Content and Community here with Chris Kubeko, one of our advisory board members. Welcome back, Chris. Oh, thank you so much for having me again. Appreciate you coming. So we have a super exciting uh, discussion today around Saudi Aramco. Ooh. Um, and as you know, they recently uh, IPO'd. Um, they floated about 30% of their shares. And they're actually the most valuable company in the world, uh, $2 trillion. And Chris, you have some intimate knowledge of Saudi Aramco, right? Like uh, you used to work with them a little bit. Yes, I do. Yes, mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. A bit more than intimate knowledge, I must say. <laughs> I know their networks inside and out. Fantastic. So we're going to be discussing today, like, is it worth it? Right. And some of the some of the elements you should be thinking about when in investing in a company like this, uh, particularly around, you know, kind of the risk elements that you were you were associated with. So you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, back in 2012, Saudi Aramco was hit by the, so far, the world's most devastating cyber warfare attack, mm -hmm. uh, which knocked out 85% of their Windows systems, a lot of their IoT systems that uh, help load fuel into uh, tanker trucks. And uh, two of their production facilities were also affected. Uh, now, during the attack, unfortunately, because it lasted a little bit longer than uh, most attacks occur, uh, the strategic supply for Saudi Arabia itself was starting to dwindle. Right. Um, Bahrain was also affected. And then 14 days after Saudi Aramco's attack, the country of Qatar and their national oil company, Razgas, was also hit just with a slight variant of Shamoon, which was the malware, and that's what it was called. And... At the time, uh, Aramco did not have any, we should say, real security or threat intelligence. Hmm. So they had not seen that on Pastebin, a group calling itself the Cutting Sword of Justice posted up that in two hours uh, they would be trying to destroy as many computer systems as possible belonging to Saudi Aramco. Gotcha. So, um, I was called in, uh, given an offer I couldn't refuse. They told me... Uh, don't say no, just say maybe, and uh, join the team and help uh, reestablish international mm -hmm. business operations for the Aramco family. And and why why were they, they attacking Aramco? What was the kind of the reason behind it? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, Geopolitically wise, uh, the Iranians who were the uh, attackers in this particular case and Saudi Arabia have not gotten along historically. So in addition to that, uh, the price of oil is very important for all national oil companies. Sure. And Saudi Ramco can produce a barrel of oil much cheaper than anyone else. Right. However, the Iranians uh, don't have the same amount of refining capabilities, so it okay. costs them a lot more to produce oil. So uh, it would be in the Iranians' best interest to drive the oil price up, and that's what uh, had started to occur when the attack happened. Gotcha. And is that what happened during the drone attack? as well or is it was there a different kind of you know the recent drone attacks that occurred on the on the oil fields oh absolutely so oil rose by almost five percent mm -hmm. uh, because of it and production at saudi ramco was diminished to a certain extent mm -hmm. yes yeah um so like that's on the supply side right so like on the defense side and we talked a lot about like kind of the demand side as well and how you know there's some changes occurring there can you talk a little bit about that uh, yeah, there's a lot of changes uh, regarding oil demand worldwide. Now, currently, uh, China is undergoing uh, basically an epidemic uh, from yeah. uh, the coronavirus. And what's happening is it's now turned into the world's largest uh, experiment of work from home because uh, people have to stay home. They're being quarantined. Cities are being shut down. Public transport's being shut down. That means that the demand for oil has dropped very sharply. Yeah. Now, there are other factors, too. China's been uh, producing and manufacturing electric buses on a massive scale, replacing all of their more traditional mm -hmm. uh, diesel and gasoline buses. That's also already been lowering demand. Then you couple that with renewable energy that's uh, more and more available in the European Union and in other countries. For example, uh, a couple of months ago, I did a presentation for the Pakistani energy minister mm -hmm. about renewable energy and transition and some of the risks that were involved with that. And 
then we have new regulations in maritime, which uh, right. will uh, force ships to be more fuel efficient. Mm -hmm. In the aviation industry, uh, there's been improvement in designs and also a shift to more biofuels. Right. Uh, there's also recently been an increase in train services in uh, Europe okay. and also from Europe to China for shipping purposes. Okay. And last but not least, uh, a very interesting thing out of Tesla with uh, what they're producing right now are electric powered semi trucks, which will absolutely disrupt uh, the oil market. Interesting. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned earlier was also around regulation. Right. So like European regulations are forcing uh, them to be more energy efficient as well. Absolutely. So by 2025, some countries in Europe and the UK, mm -hmm. uh, you will not be allowed to purchase a diesel or diesel and gasoline car at all. No more. And they've also begun phasing out older models of cars, which are not fuel efficient. Mm -hmm. And of course, I kind of glanced over the fact that you mentioned Tesla, which uh, is all in the news, uh, especially this week uh, with the nearly doubling of their stock price, right? Um, which has been great for some people. Um, yes, so, I know who to borrow money from now. Yes. Oh, well, it's retirement, retirement, um, you know, 30 years or so. Um, so the um, so t tell us a little bit about, you know, why you think it's doubled, right? And, and where, where you kind of see them going as well. Well, uh, living in Europe, uh, I've noticed that there's been a lot of tax advantages for Tesla vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when I land at Schiphol Airport tomorrow, if I can't get a ride back from the airport, I'll be taking a taxi. Mm -hmm. And that taxi will most likely be a Tesla because we actually use Tesla vehicles for uh -huh. taxis. Uh, there are free or very low car cost uh, charging stations uh, across uh, much of Northern Europe. You also get free parking, which can save you 20 euros a day if you uh, purchase an electric vehicle. So there are all these advantages. Uh, in London, you don't have to pay the congestion charge, which is 15 pound a day, which is about 20, $22 a day just to drive into the city. So uh, couple that with uh, the battery technology mm -hmm. that Tesla has been um, making and also uh, large battery installations in places like Australia and then the power walls themselves, which have been enabling people worldwide to bank power in right. a very safe and effective manner. So mm -hmm. it's been quite disruptive, I think, in a good way. However, for the oil markets, not a good way. Yes. So talk about that. A little bit. How is that hurting the oil markets? Well, the oil markets, they produce one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, two things, natural gas and oil. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, to produce something at a good profit margin, there has to be a demand. And right now, the demand has been diminishing year after year after year for at least the past five years. Mm -hmm. It's been going down. Um, however, there are some places in the world where uh, the consumption of oil keeps going up. And uh, interestingly enough, that one country where it's got the uh, uh, consistent uh, demand for uh, more and more oil consumption is actually Saudi Arabia itself. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, why is that? Uh, the way that they produce electricity is by burning oil. Okay. And it's been very difficult to cut down on consumption when you have to uh, figure in air conditioning, which uh, Saudi's kind of hot. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, there's no real, say, laws or regulations that uh, mandate that you have to have a more fuel efficient car or more fuel efficient light bulbs. Um, funny story. Uh, Saudi came out with uh, some, say, uh, pushing green energy and, and, uh, efficiency with light bulbs and uh, reducing energy consumption. And they actually did the wording backwards. So it read more like, if you turn on your lights and keep them all on, it's the better thing to do. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I think one of the areas that um, the, I'm, I'm always curious about is fracking, right? Um, so that's an area that seems to be increasing the supply in the United States, especially. Is that also reducing the demand from from the Saudis, like you know Saudi Aramco in specific for for oil? Oh, absolutely, and uh, also because of the increase in fracking in the U.S., it's also uh, reduced any dependency on Venezuela, for example, as well, mm -hmm. because they're having so many problems. So it's been able to uh, stabilize the oil markets in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have decreased demand. 
large threats to the supply, which the, you know, largely cybersecurity. Um, on the supply side, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, uh, ICS controls, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit about how a company can, you know, prevent from some of these critical infrastructure attacks and, you know, make sure that, that their, their assets are in order, so to speak? Well, uh, prioritizing security, because this is one of the key problems. We have a lot of legacy systems and things that are meant to last a very long time, mm -hmm. but then you also have to get business data out of these systems right. to get a good return on investment. So uh, newer systems are then introduced into the mix, which have new vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. and this is not an ideal situation. There are also uh, various uh, frameworks that you can look at, like the CIS controls. Yep. Uh, but most recently, uh, we're about to release uh, Cyberry's newest and greatest, I must say, um, their first uh, ICS SCADA and ICS protocol course, which Great. I've uh, written and just finished uh, filming. And that way, people can start familiarizing themselves with a lot of these control na networks and a lot of the risks associated with them. Yeah, absolutely. That way they can protect business assets, right, uh, of their companies, um, which is a lot of what our audience is interested in doing, right? Um, absolutely. Well, this has been fantastic, Chris. I really appreciate it. And um, any, any, any final thoughts for our audience? I'm very excited about your course. Um, we'll also have a CIS controls course coming out as well. So I think those couple really well together. Um, any, any thoughts for the audience? Um, I would say my uh, next Christmas list is Tesla shares. Absolutely. That's good to know. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank really you. Really appreciate you coming today. All right. Bye, guys.